Okay. Okay. So I'll start now. And the subject for me is the coming global risks and the proposal, a proposal for solution for my side. And this is a very global subject, broad subject, but I have to finish within the next 20 years. I will try to manage it. That means that uh, I might uh, skip some uh, pages and uh, if you have any questions on the skip pages, skip pages, please ask, ask, ask me in the question and the answer is fine. And uh, yes, I skip this. And uh, we are in the era of new normal. This term has been used many times in the last few years. So it's no longer a new word. And uh, the significance, and, uh, sorry, what used to be unprecedented is now occurring all the time. And this is called the new normal. In other words, uh, we now see significant historical shifts nowadays. And uh, Bretton Woods and the Smithsonian system were symbols of the international regime after the end of the Second World War. But that uh, in, 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 let's say in the, by the early 1990s, with the end of the Cold War, the system already broke. And uh, after that, 9-11 terror attacks of 2001 occurred. And immediately after that, the war with terror followed. And uh, by now, what we have seen is the unipolar world system under the U.S. is shaking. And uh, with this global standard, it used to be mean Western standard, but now it's shifting towards a new world order. Unfortunately, what kind of new world order is coming is not yet known. Some experts will say in the next 30 years, 40 years, so we are now in a very unpredictable world. And uh, hopefully it's heading towards a multipolar world rather than non-polar world. At the same time, we have to be careful, simultaneous occurrence of global incidents is at least partly uh, linked to each other. So what is happening in Iraq and Afghanistan can influence to what is going on in Europe or Africa or US or wherever. <coughs> this is the picture you want, I want to emphasize to you. And uh, part, of, part of the reasons why it's occurring. Sorry. Uh, speak it closer to the microphone, okay. please. So is it already difficult to hear? Yeah. Here now? Here. It's okay. Is it okay? Oh, oh it's the same. Yeah. Oh, it's on. Okay. So, okay. Ah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shall I repeat it? Oh, it's okay. No, it's okay? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And uh, this uh, part of the reason why it's happening is because of the uh, gaps widening between the riches and the uh, poor arts. And uh, one part is uh, increased un uh, inequality. Uh, according to one governmental research by the British, uh, tells that by the year 2030, 30, 2030, uh, only 1% of the rich people of the total population on Earth are going to uh, dominate uh, one third of the GDP of the world. And uh, this, is, uh, this is a new phenomenon, uh, particularly after the uh, end of the Cold War. And uh, when uh, mutually influenced, this anti-status quo movement is against this phenomenon from the non-rich people. And uh, mutually, it's in, these movements are mutually influenced each other. And uh, the peaceful means it's, it could be in two categories, peaceful means and violent means. Peaceful means election, the people express the discount, discontent, accumulation of discontent through election and referendum. So uh, the President uh, Trump's election was one of the cases here, and the British referendum resulted in Brexit, British uh, exit from the EU is another example here. And the violent part, riots, 
and the terror attacks and the coup d'etat. Uh, IS, right, the writing of IS uh, was one of the examples. And uh, about the coup d'etat, I by myself was uh, in the middle when it happened in Malaska. And uh, it's a kind of chronology to see the major events of uh, anti-status quo. In 2008, uh, global financial crisis happened, uh, the so-called Lehman shock. That was in itself as a result of the gap widening. And uh, in December 2010, Arab Spring started. Again, we can see this phenomenon from that aspect. And uh, just before that, in 2009, I was uh, in Madagascar as a special uh, advisor to the uh, president of the Republic of Madagascar. And the coup against him started, and I was there. So for three days, the coup soldiers tried to kill me. I was shot at so many times, but uh, they couldn't hit by my uh, kid myself. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I thought that if that was allowed to take the government uh, through coup, mean, the means of coup, then it could be popular. Uh, many country, other countries could follow it. So it was very dangerous. And immediately after that, the Arab Spring happened. And uh, what Arab Spring happened was sometimes justified for democracy movements, but they are, they are very violent and not through election any that sort of means. It was violently happening. And then in 2011, global anti-status quo established movement happened. It was called one versus 99 uh, percent uh, movement. So, uh, or yesterday uh, it was uh, touched a bit the occupation of New York movement, that kind of things happened throughout the world. And then 2014, ISIS state occupied the oil rich area called Mosul in Iraq, and it started to expand. And uh, also in this year, in September, the Scottish uh, tried the independence referendum, and it was closely avoided. But avoided means the independence was closely avoided, but Scotland can be independent at any time considering political situation at present. And this is the people in Scotland against London, that is one aspect. And uh, also uh, the next year in 2015, more than a million uh, refugees came into Europe. That triggered uh, the so-called populist uh, politicians to start to win through elections. And uh, in, in 2006, uh, 16, uh, uh, as I mentioned, uh, Britain decided to leave the EU through referendum and uh, uh, President Trump was elected. And last year, 2017, French uh, presidential election and uh, uh, Macron was elected. Macron's policy is different from the so-called populist uh, politicians' uh, policies. However, the way he won in the election was very similar uh, to what happened in Austria, uh, Hungary, and uh, Poland when the populists started to win. And uh, also, uh, <coughs> uh, British government underestimated how serious the people's uh, sentiment against London and the held the general election and the uh, uh, Prime Minister May was uh, remarkably uh, defeated. And this year, uh, consecutive defeat of German Merkel government uh, in local elections. Uh, it, all those things, if you see from the angle of the gap widening, it's very clear it's very easy to explain why it happened. And then I will quickly show, this is a picture of the coup in Madagascar. And uh, it's all, I took these photos, and these 300 meters long of the supermarket all burning, and this is at night, warehouse was burning, and uh, it's a very dangerous situation at that time. And this is in Tunisia and Egypt. In Tunisia, 
I was there uh, to attend a uh, conference called uh, Arab League and Japan. And uh, during I was staying there, it happened. Mm -hmm. And then I moved to Egypt, and it happened here. So, and then I moved to Saudi Arabia, and uh, some demonstrations started <laughs> in the capital area. Yeah. So my British, British friends, <laughs> where I'm based, uh, British friends have started to ask me every time, where are you going next? <laughs> <laughs> And this is the map we created uh, in our office. And uh, where this uh, 99% anti-eco inequality uh, movement happened, you can see in North America, uh, the Canada, and throughout Asia, and uh, even Iceland, everywhere from Oceanian states and Africa, Middle East, and even in China. This was the era uh, of uh, anti a unequality movement throughout the world. And this is the picture I took, because when I was in Washington DC, this started to be accelerated again. And uh, this is just, uh, you can see here, Occupy DC movements. And uh, I will speak, uh, skip here, but my major message here is the world has entered an era where post-second post world war experiences cannot be used to predict the future. I, we are in this era. And uh, for the rest of those, I would remind what I'm going to have to ask you to remind it. So, under the circumstances, how to respond to the era of new normal? And uh, we need for a shift in values and mindset and we need new ideas and solutions, as it And uh, crisis means also opportunities. So we need to identify what is our crisis and the uh, opportunities behind the scene. And uh, I'd like to explain it from an industrial structure's point of view. Now, uh, the modern industries started to be very flourishing uh, with the British Industrial Revolution, and it spread out into Europe. And uh, at present, Japan, Southeast Asia, China, those countries' economy is now flourishing. Therefore, people tend to think the center of modern industry, industries shifting from uh, Europe in the West to Asia in the East. But actually, it's opposite, because it started here in Europe from the UK, and uh, after the First World War, across the further Atlantic Ocean, it shifted to the US. And after the Second World War, it crossed uh, across the Pacific into Japan, and then South Asia and China. So it's moved from the east to the west. That is a reality. And after that, what will happen? That is from demographic point of view, we can talk about it. And beforehand, I want to show some interesting uh, graphs which I was given from my boss when I was working for the World Bank. And uh, until up to the end of 1960s, these uh, graphs, particularly this blue one, East Asia and Pacific states economic growth was even lower than sub Saharan African states. But from 1970, uh, the East Asia and Pacific grew very dramatically, and Af Africa very stagnated until up to the present. And when, when we see this graph, then this is a graph how Japanese investment into Southeast Asia uh, developed. And if you compare these two graphs, it's very, very overlapped. <laughs> when the Japanese uh, industry started investing into Southeast Asia massively, it's reflected to Southeast Asian economic development. Something the Southeast Asian industries and Japanese industries had a uh, uh, how do you call it? a happy marriage? Something uh, that their uh, way of thinking, sense of values, all matched together. 
So now, where it should happen next? That is my question. And uh, before then, uh, program skip it. Uh, if you are interested in then please ask me later. And uh, when we are seeing uh, regions, this is a plastic area. And uh, in a narrower definition, Japan and Asia Pacific happy marriage. And uh, here it's Middle East, Africa, and the whole of the region. And uh, we want to link between two areas, this Asia Pacific and uh, Africa, including Europe. And here we see the Indian Ocean. And uh, we in the KRA is trying to link between this region in the east and this region in the west through Indian Ocean. Why? Because I want to show this demography. Japan's stagnation nowadays started with this demography. Uh, the older people are increased, the population of uh, uh, the share of old population is large and uh, new generation, the net population of new generation is decreasing. And uh, the same phenomenon can be seen in China and in Taiwan, very similar phenomenon. In Myanmar, it's not yet this dramatic, but it started clearly. In India, also, it started. And in Iran, in this young generation in Haiti, the population of Haiti is small, uh, small because of the influence of Iraqi in Iranian war. But after that, it started to increase. And Tanzania and Madagascar, where I was shot up, they are beautifully uh, increasing the young population. So what it means is that in this map, this area in Middle East and Africa, this is the area the young population increasing. Young population is increasing. While in the rest of the world, most of the countries are facing uh, aging society. So in the future, the potential of economic growth is the highest in Africa and Middle East. That's the reason why I, we want to link between African market and the Asian market. And this is, again, I will skip. And when we are talking about how to develop economy, in the notion, the notion, the notion of national borders are fixed. This is on the basis of the Helsinki Declaration. But is it out of it? And when we are looking at three key elements of statehood, one is a permanent population. We need a population. And a defined territory, we need a territory. And a government, uh, effectively governing the country. And the three, but when we are looking at the three elements, it's clear that uh, it's going to create higher barriers around the borders. And therefore, from one country to another country, the trade and investment is going to be difficult because of this boundary. On the border, tax is imposed to all those industries. And uh, it prevents economic development, particularly in Southeast Asia and uh, Middle East and Africa. For instance, if you are Kikuyu in Kenya, there are 43 nationalities. And uh, Kikuyu is also divided by the borders. And uh, when you speak Kikuyu, and uh, when you are facing arranging, you don't know arranging language. So when you want to trade, you first want to trust the same people speaking Kikuyu each other. But they are beyond the border. And if you are told you, are the, you should trade with the same Kenyans over there, Kenyan arranging, then of course no tax for that. But you can't trust it. So these communities are divided into even smaller pieces. And that's the reason why they, uh, this boundary can prevent economic development. So, how to overcome this question problem? And uh, one hint is cultural exchange. Is it the uh, quickly, quickly, quickest way? Here, I want to show, for example, in Madagascar, it's very much French 
influenced colony, a former colony, colony of France, and it's still uh, in their language and the whole cultural system, legal system, strongly influenced by French. And uh, Mozambique from, uh, from Portugal, Tanzania, Germany, Kenya, British. So in this whole region, how to integrate the market? And if it's cultural identity, to see they are closer to each other, probably that is one of the way very quick. And then more than the government side, probably economic exchange, uh, their people's motivation <coughs> to trade each other, could let it overcome, probably. And is the European model effective or not? Probably I have another two or three minutes, but a little bit longer, go to the open. National boundaries, this is a map published by the American um, Armed Force Force Java in 2013. Probably future the boundary could be like this, borders. It's very different. Now we see another one, Washington was published, North <coughs> Africa was in 1844, the very different boundary. So the current boundary is not necessarily stick. In Europe, B Britain is facing a facility, as I said, Scotland and everywhere could be separated. In Europe, separatist movements throughout their areas. So I want to show you three different cases in Europe. What kind of? One is here, the so-called Samiran, over there. Samiran is married into internationally recognized border, Norway, and uh, Sweden, and Finland, and Russia. Now, they are forming their own government and the national flag, constitution, election. He is the president of uh, Samina, and they are nomadic people. So they are moving freely across the border. And these countries accept Russia, only accepted if the, you have a Sami ID card, you are going to travel without passport. And therefore, the local identity started to be bonded. And this is as a result of a long-run conflict, uh, ethnic conflict. This is a picture of the, the dual language uh, signpost. It's a Norwegian and Sami language. And some Norwegian unknown machine gun these Sami areas. So they don't like Sami's recognition. And he, she is a Sami president talking to me. And through this tragic history, they decided that 500 years of war, no solution. So why we don't need to let uh, Sami people to be themselves? But when this became independent, it could happen. Then what could happen is that in this territory, it's a Norwegian government and the Sami government would rule. They are good. Sweden, Swedish government and the Sami, Finnish, Finnish and the Sami. And uh, there is no single territory governed by Sami only. And uh, this could change fundamentally what the definition of a state with three elements. Here is another one. It's a different case. The ancient rivers run this way, but now because of the climate change, the course of the river changed. And therefore, this year, Belgium and uh, uh, Holland exchange swap these territories each other. So again, the territorial issue is eased now. Here it's a different thing, it's a Gibraltar in Spain. And in this peninsula, still Britain is keeping it as a, a overseas uh, prefect, uh, overseas uh, district. And uh, Spain is resisting it, and uh, with a referendum, I'm sorry, a British uh, Brexit, uh, Spain is really claiming on, on it. And here in Morocco, the center here, it's the same run by Spanish. So Sp Spanish government is claiming, is complaining about the British side, but they are doing the same in Moroccan side. And uh, how extreme it is, this is a picture. This is the Spanish road, ignoring the distance of Gibraltar. And this is the British runway, ignoring the Spanish claim of the territory. So it's crossing the runway of the airport and the road are crossing. This is uh, uh, traffic uh, lights to, to, 
to wait for the cars when the plane is uh, passing through. This is uh, another picture. And people are walking when the uh, traffic jam shows green. And uh, I went there and on the front side when you are driving, you can never see any a signpost of Gibraltar because the uh, Spanish would not recognize it. So this is extraordinary. It's a very traditional sense of border. And uh, if that traditional sense of border is everywhere, then uh, in Middle East and Africa, they are not going to grow economically. And if that continues, then uh, those lots of young people in the region might be, particularly in the poor class, poor class with a growing population might be uh, closer to be the terrorists. And if they are given uh, proper jobs, then they are going to be rescuing the rest of the world's aging society. This is my message. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, who would like to ask a question? Uh, we have two questions coming. Uh, okay. First, I'll see you, and then Kaiga. Thank you. Uh, do you think the, uh, the expansion of the Chinese capital in Africa with uh, poly the migration, is that possible? Yes, it's happening. Already happening. And uh, uh, if you see the reaction on the African side, it depends on uh, which state you're talking about. If the early stage of Chinese uh, reaching that country, uh, they are very welcoming, Chinese coming. However, if the history is becoming longer, they start to doubt and eventually they start to reject. In some countries, it's already happening. Uh, I have to say the Chinese history, mainland Chinese history, in the capitalist market is very short. So their way of investment is not sophisticated. And that's why it's failing. And that is the reason why uh, African states start to reject. And uh, because they are so easy going in decision making with a establishing a credit line, uh, line. but their credit line uh, establishment is very unsophisticated. So they need to learn more to go into Africa properly. And also the population of Chinese laborers go into Africa creating their own compound and therefore they are not going to be mixed and the locals do not think it's beneficial for the locals and a lot of social discord started that is the situation at the moment thank you okay. thank you for uh, your great presentation so uh, uh, this is simple uh, one question so how do you think uh, the future of korean peninsula yeah, uh, as far as I know, uh, both Koreans do not, I'll say, uh, ready, uh, they are not ready to be unified at the moment. And uh, nonetheless, they started to find their common interests. And therefore, uh, they are not going to be united in the near future. However, cooperation could be strengthened. And uh, in the case of North Korea, uh, sanctions did not work. Uh, sanction did not work. Uh, that's the reason why North Korea is self-motivated to open the country. Rather than uh, some people are saying uh, because of sanction they lost the confidence and they are suffering. That's why they started to open the country. That is opposite. And uh, North Korean dependency of the GDP on trade and the investment outside is very low, under 20%. And particularly their dependency on China is around 3%. And therefore, sanction from the international arena is not effective at all. If you imagine the Tokugawa shogunate regime with a, the uh, seclusion policy, what does it mean if international community tried sanction on Japan at that time? So it's not the case North Korea was actually changing because of sanction. And uh, inside the country, uh, for the first time, conference, the kind of uh, cooperatives, were recognized to, to possess uh, land properties. 
Uh, under the communist fundamentalist policies, that is surprising thing that uh, they started doing that. So inside, the money started to move. So the economy is rather successful. And nonetheless, they decided to open the country. So North Korea, South Korea, US cooperation will be strengthening selling and from now on. Although up and down is predictable, but eventually they are going to be closer to each other. Thank you very much. Excellent presentation. Thank you.